It's my pleasure to introduce the director, Lagos State Employment Trust Fund, up until September 1, and also the co-founder for Electa in the person of Abosede George Organ. Abosede, great to have you um, here. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. It's really good to be here. Thank Excellent. Also joining us this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're watching us from, we have the Director General, Due Process Office for your state. And a little birdie said she's also referred to as Madam Due Process in the person of Tara de Fokbe. Thanks, Tara. Great to have you. They didn't plan it. They're just great minds that think alike, you know, wearing the black outfit. I said to them, I didn't get that memo, but uh, it's fine. We, we will still proceed. Now, I'm sure some people are watching and thinking, mm, is it only women that serve with integrity? Because we are featuring women who are doing great work, particularly in the public sector, who are serving with integrity and about to have that conversation. But don't worry, we have a gentleman with us. Now, not here physically, but he's very well joining us via telephone conferencing in the person of the managing director, Lagos State Waterways Authority, Oluwa Damilola Emmanuel. Hello, Damilola. Good to have you on this panel. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. If you, if you can hear Dami and all of us here, please put it in the comment section. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. All right. Now, I'll go straight to it, uh, and I'll start with perhaps Bossade, who is on my immediate left, with regards to uh, just a little, ex tell us a little bit about your experience in public service. How has it been so far? Um, how has it been working in that kind of environment and serving with integrity? Thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, for me, I've always been passionate about public sector. Um, and that journey sort of started, well, in my case, my career started in international development, um, and then I went to private sector and eventually ended up in public sector. So I've always had a strong conviction um, that the private sector plays a really significant role, and so does the nonprofit sector, so the third sector. But I am convinced that for us to bring about significant change for the most amount of people, then that is the work of government, because government exists for public good. And that was really my pull, right, towards public service. Um, and I have to be honest, I, I had a fabulous experience um, at the Lagos State Employment Fund, and it gave me an insight into how government can work. And I feel like there are a few characteristics. The first thing is you need a team of people who are competent, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is you need to have the right legislative and policy framework right, for those people to do their job. Because it's one thing to get a team who have competence, who can do the job, but if they're in an environment that doesn't enable them to deliver on what it is that you have um, given them as an assignment, then there'll be a challenge. So I found that they, they couple of things that make um, effective governance much easier than others. Um, so in terms of my experience, I have to be honest, what I realized was when you have competent people and you have the right legislative and policy framework and people who want to do the work, then the work can be done. And that work that I did as part of the team in Lagos State was creating jobs. And I have to say that in four years, we did amazing work. Excellent. Thank you very much. You. If you are a beneficiary of the amazing work they yes. did, please put it in the comment section. It's always good to get instant feedback. <laughs> All right. Now, I'll ask a bit differently, uh, Tara. Still the same question, still in the same line. Since you're Madame Due Process, you know, a number of people say that for you to get into public service, even the process itself is, you know, in some cases lacks integrity. How, you know, how was your own journey into getting into public service, into getting into the, the position that you're in? Was it a transparent process? How did you get this job? Okay, so let me tell you a bit about my background. So I've always been in this governance, regulation, and compliance piece. Um, I did a master's in corporate governance as far back as when nobody even knew what corporate governance was. So I will have conversations with people and people will say, what's that? I've always been passionate about governance. And at that time, I probably thought it was just limited to the business world and the corporate world. Little did I know that got, you know, a lot more in store. So started that journey and that's just always been sort of the career path that I've followed. Along the lines, as you know, it could be challenging. There were times where I was asking myself, this compliance thing, you know, and all this governance, is it really, really worth it? Should I do something else? 
you know, and so even when I tried to do other things, it just, you know, I just couldn't let go, you know, so I continued down that path. So at a particular point, our executive governor now, I was actually going to do some compliance work for him in a private capacity. He's coming at the time. And, but that didn't work, which I now understand to be timing. So I moved on and then I started working with the IFC in the corporate governance space as well, on the Africa corporate governance program. And then the elections happened. <laughs> he won and then he called me into a meeting. And so I was in Accra at the time. I said, okay, when I get back, um, we will sit down and we'll talk. And so he sat me down and he said, what are my thoughts and what do I think, what role would I like to play in the administration? And I just felt this restraint, don't say words, so I didn't, I didn't speak. I said, what are you thinking of? And right there and then he offered me the job and said to me, I have no doubt, first of all, he encouraged me. He said, I have no doubt that you can do it. But then he said something, he said, I have no doubt that your experience in compliance would come to bear in this a lot. And at that moment, I knew, well, for such a time as this. <laughs> and so here we are. That's yes. brilliant. Thank you very much. A few things to, uh, to note from your story, which is that it's important to be faithful in little, because it was from your experience of working with him prior to him being governor that made him you know, entrust this position in your care and offered you the position uh, to be uh, the director uh, due process in your state. Thank you. Now, I'll move on to uh, Dami, who is speaking to us. Uh, and Dami, you're, yep. you're, we know that it's one thing to be female, which we have Bostede and uh, Tara. But young, being young, particularly in a state like Lagos State, the commercial center of the giant of Africa, it's interesting to see a young man serving with integrity in public service. How has this experience been for you? Well, what's it been like? And how do you keep your head you know, above water despite the politicking that might you know, go on in this kind of office? Well, thank you very much. I don't know, can you hear me? Can you hear me loud and clear? Loud and clear, thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, um, when you ask that question, the, for me, what just strikes me immediately is the foundation. Um, your core values as an individual would always be tested um, and will come to play. Um, so I think for me, um, going into that office, one of the first things that um, happened to me, interestingly, was that uh, a day before I was promoted, um, I was sort of like elevated in church and given a, a major role in my church. And for me, I never see those things as a coincidence because I just felt there's something about this. So I knew that, you know, going into that role, I must have the right foundation. Um, and I think one of the core things for me was, you know, humility. Um, always remembering that because I, every time I, I see myself in the office, I keep remembering that the way you climbed up this ladder, the people you left at the bottom, they're the same people you're going to meet if you become proud. Because when you're on, when you're on your way down, you are going to have to, you know, uh, meet with them as well. So for me, one, humility. Um, another thing I would say that's really, really helped me in government is relationship, relationships, um, ability to maintain, to sustain, and be able to build relationships. In government, you need to be able to build relationships. If you don't know how to maintain and sustain relationships, you'll be in serious trouble because you would always need all kinds of favors from different kinds of quarters. And if you can build the relationships appropriately, um, you would always you know, be able to succeed. So for me, I would say one, I mean, humility, the fact that you know, God made me, I mean, God gives grace to the humble. So God has given enough grace to be humble in the office. Um, and I think with humility has come wisdom and every other thing I've required. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Again, talking about uh, what you do whilst being small, in quotes, and how that helps you when you get to that position of authority or yet to that position. So for many of us who are not yet there and are looking forward to perhaps working in public service and serving with integrity, this is something to think about. What are you doing with the little that has been committed into your care? Are you faithful? What do you do when no one is watching? Do you have integrity? 
because it's the same person who will take on service publicly if you know in, with that same attitude with that same manner if you don't check yourself so ask yourself who am i right now with the little i've been given all right now let, let's talk about what is popularly referred to as a nigerian brand of integrity first of all the first thing i'll ask you let me ask you tara is is there such a thing as a nigerian brand of integrity i had a conversation with a few friends of mine the other day and we we're talking about leadership and integrity and they happen to be in different parts of the world and some of them were like, you know, the others were like, it was okay for them to understand the concept of not, you know, doing certain things uh, and, and serving properly. And for many of the Nigerians on the call, they just couldn't, they said, how is that possible? You know, Nigeria, Nigeria's case is a different matter. Is it possible to be 100%, you know, full of integrity, working in public service in Nigeria? And uh, how can we change that narrative that there's a different brand of integrity for Nigerians? Absolutely, I did. To me, there is no, what is my, what is that? Like, yeah, you know, let me even put it back to you. What does that even mean? You know, I mean, you're either one way or another. There's no such thing as, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle, you know. But I think a lot of times, even we as Nigerians, we are the, what we, sometimes, to put it bluntly, we are the problem, you know. We easily say, I, I always liken corruption in Nigeria to basic economics, demand and supply you know, and it thrives. So when it's your turn, so we're all shouting now and saying we want to do this a certain way. Yes, you know, let's um, wear this hat, you know, this integrity hat. And then when it's you that needs that license, for example, are you ready to cut corners? Most people, yes. So that's where we start having this redefinition, quote unquote, of what the Nigerian brand of integrity is. But there's no such thing as that. You're either hot or you're cold. It's just that simple, you know. And it just hurts me. It's just the way people will say, oh, Nigerians are corrupt. What, what does that mean, you know? There's so many. I think that's what this conference is all about. Anyway, there's so many people who are willing to do things the right way, you know? I mean, to sort of personalize this and go into my own role, for example, they know, you know, and it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. But without a doubt, you know, it's gotten to that point where people know I was talking to Bosek, because Bosek my sister, we've known each other for years, just before we came. And I was telling her that, you know, someone was seizing the other day and saying, oh, what a due process, as they call me. You know, has a smile for everyone, but, you know, bring your file that has an issue, and then it's a different story, right? And there's so many people like that. Even thinking of your state right now, there's so many, there's so many. A friend of mine visited me once and said, you know there's so many like you. He said this even before this conference. Yeah. And I said, absolutely. He said to me, find them. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, I found them. There's so many. There's so many like that. I was telling Bosse as well, just before I came on, that somebody recently was awarded a contract. And he's not from Oil State, nothing. He came to Lagos and was telling somebody that. And then so the word came back. Do you know that I got awarded this amount, a contract? you know, this sum, and nobody collected a dime from me. So it's possible. I it think really that deserves is. a round of applause. It so really please, in the is. comment section, just give a round of applause to that particular situation. It's worth celebrating. We will get to a point where not just one case out of several uh, uh, sound like that, but every case sounds like that. And indeed, where you have to pay someone to get a contract to begin to sound very foreign. And everyone said, Amen. All right, so Bosse, let me come to you. Now, when it comes to employment, creating jobs in Lagos, you know how sensitive that is. And, you know, they would say that you have to know someone to get something, even when they give an allocation. Government still has its own, you know, uh, catchment. How did you manage, as a woman serving with integrity, with these kinds of challenges whilst in office? So I think there are a few things, um, and I'm so excited that, you know, um, Tara and Damilola have shared practical examples. Um, so I think that when uh, the Employment Trust Fund started in Lagos, one of the things that we needed to quickly do was prove to people that you could actually apply without knowing anyone, and you could either become a beneficiary or not. And as I said before, one of the things that helps that process is having a transparent and open process where people know, look, you apply either by form and you go to this local government 
or you apply online and it goes through a process. So one of the things that we did was um, when we started off, uh, the PricewaterhouseCoopers actually used to verify the entire application process. So by outsourcing it to a credible firm, um, we made it very clear that we have nothing. So there's nothing that wants to happen. First of all, you have to apply, right? Regardless of who you are. The first level check doesn't happen with anybody within the fund. So there's nothing anybody can do, right? So if 100,000 people have applied, and then we're going to get a short list of 10,000, what is the probability that it will be my brother or my sister or my uncle or my aunt? And I think that that was the power of the word aunt. And I think that that was the LSETF did in the sense that somebody had an uncle, an aunt, a cousin, or a friend who had benefited. It was really powerful, right? So from the grassroots, from Badagri, from everywhere, because the process was the same, and it was transparent, and it was communicated as such. I mean, even if you went physically to the liaison offices, you would see a clear sign there, you don't pay anyone, because there have been government initiatives where people then make it, you know, there's this uh, middleman. We made it clear that that was not an option. Fantastic. So if I can learn lessons from you, you know, as during your time there, it's put structures in place, communicate those structures, and around you yourself, put checks and balances to ensure that you don't fall, you know, along the way. Truthfully, some people do start with the best of intentions, but they say, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So it's beyond the good intentions. What are the practical structures you're putting in place to ensure that you continue down that road until you get to your destination? So excellent. Thank you very much for sharing those points. Now, Dami, I'll come to you for, for this now. With regards to your position, I know that today we're calling on the 7,000. And, and like Dr. Oduwale said, we do believe that there are more than 7,000. And I know as many people as watching are uh, one of those 7,000. But we also know that there are people who are not part of the 7,000 who do not have that, um, who do not have that commitment to serve with integrity. And we also know that some of these people could very well be our bosses or our line managers who that we are responsible to. How do you manage that sort of situation when you are a man who is committed to serving with integrity and surrounded with people, even subordinates to be fair, who do not have such commitments? How do you hold yourself and ensure that you are still sticking to the plan? Thank you so much for that question. You know, before you even ask me this question, I was already thinking to myself that how did Daniel, how did Joseph function back then? They worked with, they worked with, with, with we'll, say, we'll say evil kings or corrupt kings or kings that were not functioning. But if you read very carefully those books, and you know, and this is not to just say, I mean, go too spiritual, but we should be spiritual, you know what I mean? But Daniel was knowledgeable. Daniel read the books of the land. Daniel understood the culture of the people. Daniel was good looking and presented himself in an appropriate way. So, you know, even you as well, serving under that kind of leader, you have to bring your A game on. You can't just say, oh, I'm, I, I pray in the morning and then I'm going to be okay. Everything about you, I mean, nobody's saying be perfect, but make sure you bring your A game on. Make sure you take steps ahead. You know, whenever you're given a task, do much more than is expected of you, you know, because after a while, even that leader who's above you begins to ask, uh, what is it about this guy? You know, and, and one of the things you must remember is that if you are the kind of subordinate that is always looking for problems to solve, because in government, there are always all kinds of problems. And guess what? These 7,000, we are the ones with the solutions. We have those solutions with us. So at every point in time, and I'm saying this even to myself right now, because one of the things I've realized, even in the sector I'm in right now, is that, look, it's just bedeviled with problems. So all I'm saying to myself every day now is that, what are the solutions to these long-standing problems? Enough of saying, oh, this problem has gone on for this long. But what are the solutions? Because those solutions are downloadable. So for me, being able to serve on those kind of people, one, you have to bring on your A game, right? You have to, your appearance even matters. Sometimes we think our appearance doesn't matter. No, there's a way in which even the person who is your leader will say, that guy always 
I mean, he doesn't even strike me as someone who they'll call spiritual, whatever it is, because yes, he's looking good. No one is saying without it, but then you bring your A game on in terms of your appearance. You make sure you're knowledgeable. Make sure you're even a step ahead, you know? Um, wide you need to read wide sometimes and you know and obviously be able to solve problems look for problems these leaders right they always have problems and just imagine any subordinate who is able to solve all your problems before you know what's happening he begins to seek uh, your advice and then guess what happens without him even knowing it you have control over that leader which you didn't intentionally want to put out there thank you Excellent. Thank you very much. As you mentioned the story of Daniel, it reminds me that everyone is looking for a problem solver. Sometimes your bosses will hate you, but they cannot deny the fact that you're an excellent worker and cannot deny you certain positions because they know that you're a problem solver. Case in point, think about David and Saul. Saul didn't like to see David. However, he knew that whenever he played the harp, something happened. And so despite his personal misgivings, he still had to have him around you. So here's a question to you this evening. What kind of worker are you? Are you a problem solver or do you add to the problem? Are you hardworking? Are you diligent? Are you an indispensable member of the team? So that despite the fact that you stick to being an upright worker, your boss cannot deny you because he or she knows that they need you on that team. That's something to think about. Now, I'm going to come to you based on faith because, I mean, I know that all three of you are people of faith and your faith plays a big role in how you um, discharge your duties, particularly in your place of work. And I'd like to go practical. Before I ask you the, the question, I, I, to be in two parts, so you have time to think of the second part, okay? <laughs> so we talked about integrity throughout today. The theme is serving with integrity. However, I'd like you to break it down. You know, Dami started by mentioning a few things, hard work, you know, showing up on time, showing up there. There are also many things that people might, perhaps might not think is a component of integrity. It's not only about not collecting bribes. There are certain things, not stealing the time of your employer, for instance. So can you break it down? Some of the things that are practical ways to serve integrity. And then the one I want you to think about while you're answering this one is, I want you to tell us a practical situation whereby you were faced with a difficult situation to compromise and what you did or how you handled it. That would be something I'd like you to share. Okay, so who wants to go first? Just very practical things. What are the components of integrity? So we're talking about serving with integrity. Yes, it's been defined as what you do when no one is looking. But what are the component of, component of integrity? Okay, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to start. So I think it's really important, and I think that um, Dami started to allude to it earlier around your core values. Um, I think for me, you know, I grew up, I grew up in, a, in a house of service. So my dad was in the Air Force and my mom was a teacher. And so they served this country for 35 years. To be honest, I didn't know at the time, but now looking back, I realized that they then infused in me the culture of service. So I care a little too much. And like you were saying, some people don't care as much. It's just what it is, right? Um, so what serving with integrity looks like is that when you are doing any job, you recognize that you are doing, you are a vessel. Does this make sense? That you are just being used to be able to achieve something. And like I said, that's why I really like the public service because it, it exists for public good and primarily for public interest, right? Because whether you like it or not, they're private businesses and their business is private interest, right? But that's the power of government, right? Because it exists for all. And so if government can work, then it's inclusive and many will benefit. So going, waking up and saying, look, boss, we, you're trying to create jobs. How can we really create jobs, right? So that problem-solving mentality is one. The second one is that, look, you have to be accountable to yourself. And that's why what Dr. Jumoke said about having those private conversations with the audience of one, I think is very powerful. Because you need to be able to tell yourself what is important. And then legacy. I think that people don't think about tomorrow. I always, maybe because I've always done impact work that involves humans, I always think, will this thing last beyond me? And that's the beauty. When I walk away from this job, from this role, will it still exist, right? And then the final one is, you know, there's a nature and a character of Jesus. There is a nature and character of Jesus. And the question is, 
when you work with your colleagues, as you build those relationships, and as you work, can they see Jesus? What do they see? So there's the day-to-day, because I feel like a lot of people feel like you leave your Christian self at home, and then you take a different person to work. But if I can bring it together for somebody today, it's in your nature and in your character. Are you kind? You know, do you ask people, how are you? And do you mean it? You know what I mean? Even in the workplace. When nobody's looking, like you said, are you working or are you playing? Do you know what I mean? So I feel like there's the part where the fruits of the spirit, you know, come to bear and people can see Jesus in the way that you work, in the way. And I've, I've met people like that, you know, when we talk about the 7,000. I've met people who, in the workplace, I could see that there was something about them. And because they were shining lights. So these things are real. And in the, cur- in the course of your work, people can experience these things. And that is what begins to make people say, you know what? I would like to be like this person. And they might not even be able to figure it out. But the truth is, they're paying attention, they're watching, and they're seeing the impact of that nature and that characteristics. And that's what happens when your boss now promotes you. And people are like, ah, ah. you know, they can't touch it, they can't feel it, but it's what you have expended in being like Christ. Brilliant. Thank you so very much for breaking it down so well. I'll come to you, Tara. Would you like to add your thoughts to what Bossy has shared with us, please? I will. But well, my answer is very short, to be honest, because you just have a check within you. And for me, I ask myself, would the Father be pleased with me? Mm. It's just that simple. Mm. And you think about it, you can put that in everything that you do, from how you treat people, from how you comport yourself, from how you do your work, from how you even spend government funds. Yes. Really, even when you're well within your rights, sometimes you check yourself, is it necessary, you know? So what would the father do? And when I'm not there, what would people say? Excellent, thank you very much. Dami, I know you've shared a few things with regards to uh, being faithful, being diligent in the place of work. Would you like to add something or would you like to just go straight to that very difficult situation in the workplace where you uh, were tempted to compromise or you were faced to compromise and how you escaped from that, just like Joseph escaped <laughs> from Joseph's <laughs> wife. How did you escape? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think, I think I'll, I'll just quickly touch on the first one. You know, for me, um, when you talk about integrity as well, serving with integrity, one of the things I think about is how do you empower those below you, you know? Um, and, and, and anyone that sort of knows me and the work I do at Lasswa is that I brought my personal touch to the, to the job. So I realized that when you're at the top, you're, you, some, you seem to be like in a bubble. Um, you, you never ever know it, but a lot of the time you've just been a bubble at the top, not really knowing what's going on down there. So what I purposely did was I busted that, I mean, I burst that bubble and I made sure I had a bottom up approach with all my staff. Like I have a personal, I would say a personal relationship, even down to the janitor, even down to the front desk officer, like Sometimes when I'm alone in the office and I stand with them through my cameras or anything, I just call them into my office, I engage them, we talk, you know, so I have that one-on-one connection. And, you know, um, I give a, I, I mean, there are some people in my office who, when I, when I got there initially, I mean, in four, four years ago, some of them were barely, you know, not doing anything. You know, um, one of them, I'll give an, a typical example, was probably the security guard. But now he's a front desk officer. He's developed himself. He's grown. So those kind of stories as well has, you know, sort of impacted me. So I think we serve with integrity. It's also about how we've been able to empower and help people. Um, now, to the very difficult and tough situation, it's a very personal thing. But I think really today we're being a, we just want to break those tables and benefit people as much as we can. Because let me not lie to you, we will face those situations. And a lot of the time, you know, um, you would always feel like, was this meant to be or not meant to be? Okay, so um, when my last child was about to be born, um, the, I mean, the, the, she was, I mean, he was born in America, but the, the exact amount I needed for that was, was, the, was a particular money which was available in my organization. Right. And like, 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 I think like Tara just said, it was within my rights to take that money and not 
I mean, make make sure my staff benefit from a bonus or anything. It was the exact amount I needed. And and I, and like I don't remember who said it as well, but this person spoke about con- self control and about that restraint and about that one minute of asking yourself, Lord, can I do this or I can't? You know. And for me, it was such a difficult thing because if I didn't, guess what happened? I couldn't pay the bills in America. But you know, I just remembered, and God just said to me that you know what, give this out, and make sure your staff go home happy this Christmas. Um, and, and make sure those bonuses are paid. Um, so I did that, and not up to a day of making that decision, that money came back to me, and it wasn't through anything. It was through something I had totally forgotten, a job I had totally forgotten I had done way back, and I got paid for it the exact same amount. Thank you. Excellent. What a wonderful wonderful experience thank you very much for sharing that with us dami uh, just talking about investing in people and also remembering the fact that at the end of the day our source is god it's yeah. not any man it's not our job yeah. and so when you serve with integrity ultimate like you know the bible does say that whatever we do in our place of work or we do unto man we should do as serving unto the lord so thank you dami for sharing i'll ask uh, tara and then i'll come to you bossy for me, I mean, difficult situation, maybe pressure, but I have to say I'm very fortunate because we have a leader, we have a governor who has set that to, you know. So it's integrity roundabout, it's transparency and accountability roundabout. So, you know, when you have an enabling environment, then you can thrive. So for me, um, I think very easily people know, you know, that this you know, in this space, this is sort of, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. But, you know, regardless, you see, so that's why I said maybe pressure, you know, with people saying, you know what, I need this thing done, you know, ASAP, has this thing going to be done? And you know that, look, there's laid down process, there, there's something maybe wrong with this or the other, you know. So I tell you what I do, I pray. It's just that simple. I pray, I leave it, you know, and thank God for God's wisdom. You handle situations, but I think with things like um, that's why I said with the enabling environment and people know now not to come with money and things like that because they just know that that's not going to work, that's not going to fly, you know. As you know, I mean, something happened recently and someone came to a member of my team and offered them money, you know, and she wouldn't take it. And he said to her, Omotara, love it, love it, Omotara, (laughs) Omojesu. Excellent. For those who don't speak Yoruba, perhaps Omo means the daughter or the offspring or replica of a certain person. Thank you so much. And finally, Bosse. So um, I was thinking that I didn't have one practical one, but the Holy Spirit did well to remind me. Um, So I've always worked as an enabler. So what that means is because of my skills around sort of stakeholder management, communication, fundraising, we're always the cost center. So I manage a team that is the cost center of the organization. Um, And I I mean, that's why I said I didn't have any, but the Holy Spirit did well to remind me. I definitely think that in four years, all the vendors that we have used, including those who had retainers, I'm sure they are surprised that neither myself or my team ask them for, you know, it's, it's normal, right? So especially if you're going to be on a retainer, because then that's like assured money, right, for even your small business. But we didn't ask for, you know, put our own inside or anything like that. So that's one. And then I remembered a practical experience recently where we had an excess, right? And it was going to, you know, it had been approved. It had left the organization in this case. So it could have really gone away and nobody would know, right? Um, It would have maybe been between me and the agency because it was now outside of our institution. Um, but I did very well to document that we had an excess, and this would be the process for that amount of money to come back into the organization. And as Damilola said, you know, God then reminded me, because I had need for uh, something really huge, right, which that money would have been maybe 1% of that problem, and God solved that problem. And God told me that it was because you, did, you were not tempted. So temptation will come. Right? But God reminded me, even before today, that because you did that, I took care of your needs. And so that's something that's so important.
important. As you said, God is our source, and we must remember that. Excellent. Thank you so very much. And thank you for being vulnerable in sharing things that perhaps you wouldn't have wanted to talk about, but has hopefully encouraged as many people as are watching and uh, giving them the commitment to serve with integrity. I'm sure you'd agree with me that they've done such a fantastic job. Please give them a round of applause. Tag them in the comment section. Thank, thank them for paving the way in public service to see that if they did it, then it's very possible as well for you to do so. You can thrive while serving with integrity. One more time, a big thank you to Abbas Ede George Organ. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Tara Adefokbe. And thank you, Oluwadan Lola Emmanuel.